All right, so the next topic we're going to get into is preparation of alcohols by using reducing reagents. So this will be new chemistry, not review of previous chemistry. So let's take a look at reducing agents for aldehydes and ketones. And there's a variety of ways to reduce aldehydes and ketones. Let's just take a ketone as an example. What's the oxidation state of this central carbon? Would it be a positive 2, positive 3? What do you think? Positive 2. Okay, so it's got an oxidation state here. Let's imagine that we want to change that double bond to a single bond. So by doing that, we'd be adding in two hydrogens, kind of like that. What's the oxidation state going to be for this carbon now? What do you think? It'd be zero, right? Because when we think about circling, we get half of these carbons, half of that, all of those, and then none of those. So in here, we'd have one, two, three, four. Carbon wants four, so it'd just be an oxidation state of zero. All right, so during this reaction, is the carbon being oxidized or reduced? It must be gaining two electrons, so it's reduced. All right, so a reducing agent can maybe transfer two electrons to that carbon, cause it to be reduced into an alcohol. All right, how do we typically, in organic chemistry, convert double bonds to single bonds? Think about a carbon-carbon double bond. How do we go from an alkene with a carbon-carbon double bond to an alkane that's a carbon-carbon single bond? H2. And we typically need a catalyst, whoops, like palladium on carbon. So this can work. However, I'm going to make a note. This reaction requires really high pressure. and therefore isn't often used. I think it requires something like 200 PSI of hydrogen, which most labs aren't equipped to do safely, so most chemists just avoid this reaction. But theoretically, we could do the same chemistry that we've seen before if our lab is equipped with that. I'll show you another way that's a lot better. So let's say we have this ketone. And we want to get to the same alcohol. And our goal is to still get that new hydrogen installed there, right? So we're going to be going from a ketone to an alcohol. Is this alcohol going to be primary, secondary, or tertiary? It's a little bit weird to think about, but the way I always do this is I look at the carbon right here that the alcohol is attached to, and then I ask myself, how many other carbons is this carbon bonded to? Two. So this would be a secondary alcohol. The reagent we can use to accomplish this really easily without high pressure glassware is sodium borohydride, NaBH4. It's a really common reagent in organic chemistry. In addition, we need an organic solvent, which is typically an alcohol like methanol or ethanol, something like that that's cheap and readily available. So this works really well. Let's take a look at aldehydes. So over here we've got our aldehyde. What do you think we'll make if we treat this with NaBH4 and an alcohol? See if you can predict what the product would be. Does anybody have an idea? It would be an alcohol, right? We would still have the original chunks, but we would still need to add in that new hydrogen, right? So that blue hydrogen, we added that in. Is this primary, secondary, or tertiary? It would be a primary alcohol. 
All right, so this is pretty useful. We can convert ketones to secondary alcohols, aldehydes to primary alcohols. Let's try another one. This time we'll work backwards. Okay, so we'll have NaBH4 and our alcohol. And this time my goal is to make a tertiary alcohol. All right, so my question is, what reagent could we use at the beginning? Or does anybody spot a problem? Well, a lot of students will say, well, what about doing something like this? Oh, that looks all wrong. Yeah, exactly. So we would cross this out, and then I would make a frowny face on here and saying, this reaction is not possible. So really, when we think about trying to form alcohols using these reducing agents, we can make secondary alcohols and primary alcohols. However, we really can't make tertiary al alcohols using these types of reducing agents. All right, so now let's take a look at the mechanism. The mechanism's kind of neat. It's a clever workaround to a problem we saw last term. So I'm going to go ahead and draw out all of our carbon atoms just so we can keep track of everything really clearly. And I'm just going to use a ketone. However, this works for aldehydes too, like we saw above. And sodium borohydride has four hydrogens bound to boron. What charge will that boron have? Be minus, right? Boron normally has a valence of three. It's kind of unusual that way. But in this case, it's got an extra hydrogen. Therefore, it's got a negative charge. That means that the sodium is just a spectator cation. So now if we think about our aldehyde or our ketone, we might notice that we've got this oxygen that's hogging electron density away from that carbon, right? So the carbon is really, really electron deficient. It wants to find some electrons to maybe contribute electron density towards it. The boron, on the other hand, is really, really electron rich. It's got a negative charge. So what ends up happening is an entire hydride, meaning a hydrogen and its electrons, will get transferred over to that electron deficient carbon. And then to avoid the Texas carbon problem, we're going to break this pi bond and kick electrons up to that oxygen. And now when we do this, we're almost done. But now we've covalently bonded this hydride all the way over here. What do you think the last step's going to be? Protonation. All right, so the question is, well, where do we get the proton from? What do you think the acid source might be? The alcohol. We still have that alcohol solvent around. So in this next step, typically your alcohol solvent is going to be your source of protons for this last proton transfer step. Oops, sorry, that should be a single bond. So I'm going to make a few notes on here. First note is that this is your solvent. And then the other thing is during that initial step. Last term, I said that hydride, H minus, is insoluble in a really, really crummy nucleophile. In this case, though, we're showing hydride acting as a nucleophile. So by coupling this hydride to boron, we can actually make that hydride source soluble. So this was the clever workaround that they were able to figure out. So let's make a note here.
cannot use NaH. Why can't we use NaH? Even though it's H minus 2. It's not soluble at all. So like we said last term, the reason it was a good base but not a good nucleophile was due to the fact that this sodium hydride is not soluble. Therefore, it's not going to act as a nucleophile. However, by using NaBH4, we've created a kind of workaround where we've made this hydride soluble by kind of tethering it onto the boron that's going to be the transport agent in this case. Does that make sense? All right. So let's go on to the next part. Do reducing agents for some other carbonyl groups, specifically carboxylic acids and esters. All right, so let's take a look at a carboxylic acid. If we tried to treat this with NaBH4, a problem happens. If we try to treat this with NaBH4, no reduction occurs. Does anybody think they might have an idea for what might occur if no reduction does? What's another reaction that could occur? What's the fastest reaction in chemistry? Acid-base chemistry. We've got carboxylic acid. We've got sodium borohydride, which we said is a source of hydride, which is a good base. So really what happens in this situation, we just end up with this, and no reduction occurs. that's one pitfall. All right, if we try to do the same thing with esters, could say, well, in this situation, really there's going to be no acid-base chemistry. Instead, you'll just get no reaction. So then the question is, well, why is this happening? Well, let's take a look at the ester example. What's the oxidation state for this carbon? What would it be? Plus three. All right, so in this ester, it's positive three. What would it be over here? It'd be plus three. All right, so sodium borohydride, for some reason, is struggling with carbons that have an oxidation state of positive three. Let's go back up in our notes and go back to the aldehydes and ketones where sodium borohydride worked. Okay, so up here, I'm going to erase all of this. We said that this has a positive 2 charge. What about an aldehyde? What do we think? Oh, man, there's a lot of numbers being thrown around. All right, let's go in here. We're going we're gonna to split this in half, right? What about the carbon-oxygen? Carbon's going to get all, or it's none of those. We're going to get all of these, right? So we've got one electron here, two electrons here. So it's three. Carbon normally has four. So what would it be? One. All right. All right. So now let's take a look at it. In the big picture, we said that NaBH4 is working pretty well for carbons that have oxidation states of positive 2 or positive 1. However, down here with carbons that have an oxidation state of positive 3, it's just not getting the job done. What do you think we could do as a workaround, just generically? Probably need a stronger reducing agent, right? All right, so let's take a look at this. All right, so by using a stronger reducing agent, maybe we can overcome that barrier of the carbon having a plus three oxidation state and get this reaction to work somehow. 
All right, so let's take a look at the new ones. The new reagent we're going to use looks a little bit similar. It's LIALH4. This is often just abbreviated in your textbook as LAH. It's lithium aluminum hydride. And we'll draw that out in a second here, but for right now, let's just focus on that. And this works well with carboxylic acids. And when you react this with a carboxylic acid, whoops, sorry, I forgot step two should be water here. When you react this with a carboxylic acid, it'll actually add two hydrogens to that carbon. So what we've done is we've gone from an oxidation state of plus three to what oxidation state? Be negative one, right? Because that hydrogen and carbon, the carbon's going to be more electronegative. It's going to get all four of the electrons between the carbon and hydrogens, and then half the electron between the R group, or one of those electrons, I should say. All right, so we're able to do this four electron reduction and deliver two hydrogens that way. Have we made a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol? Primary. All right, so this worked well. We were able to overcome that barrier by using a stronger reducing agent. Let's take a look at the next one. Again, we're going to use an ester because esters also are similar to carboxylic acids in that they have an oxidation group of positive three. And we're going to use the same reagent followed by water. And this one's kind of interesting. We're still going to get a primary alcohol. But we're also, actually I'm going to put R prime over on this ester. But we're also going to get another fragment that comes off. So what happens in this case is this portion of the ester at the end actually gets kicked off into its own unique group during this process. So you actually can fragment esters into two generic pieces. The first piece will be a primary alcohol. The second piece will just be another alcohol. Whatever was attached to that carbonyl group will pop off. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, this group right here? That's a good question. In fact, I'm going to make a note that we will cover the mechanism for carboxylic acids next term. Unfortunately, they don't include it in this chapter, and I don't want to overcomplicate things. I want to keep the same theme going, but for right now, we'll kind of focus on the mechanism for esters. Does that make sense? All right, so let's take a look at that mechanism for esters. All right, so I'm just going to make up an ester. Actually, let's do an actual ester. got methyl acetate here as our ester. It's just going to be our generic ester over here. And then let's take a look at lithium aluminum hydride. It looks a lot like borohydride, but instead it's got aluminum in the center. If you look at the periodic table, you notice how aluminum is right below boron. Typically, do things get more or less reactive as we go down the periodic table? It depends, right? Let's think about group 1A with the alkali metals. What's more reactive, potassium or lithium? Potassium. Typically, as we go down, things get more reactive, especially with the metals. So in this case, aluminum being a metal is going to get a lot more reactive. Another way of thinking about it is aluminum's a lot bigger. It's going to have a harder time hanging on to an itty-bitty hydride atom. All right? 
And then the counter cation, in this case, it's just going to be lithium. It's just hanging out. So just like we saw before, this whole hydrogen with its electrons, meaning the hydride, is going to act as our nucleophile. And it's going to attack this carbon, and it's going to kick up electrons to that oxygen. Oops. And there we go. All right, but at this step, it's not done. Instead of another hydride attacking in, there's something else that can happen. It's a little bit unusual, but what happens is this negative charge will just clamp back down, and then it will shove off this group almost as a leaving group. So I'll make a note here, this acts as a leaving group. Why do you think this might be an okay leaving group? Why is it okay getting shoved off? The the yeah, the negative charge is on oxygen. Oxygen being electronegative can handle that negative charge. All right, so in this step, this is our leaving group that got shoved off, right? What have we made, though, for our other half? What do we call this functional group? Oh. So we started with an ester. What do we call a CO double bond where the carbon is attached to a hydrogen? Aldehyde. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, the problem is we cannot stop at this aldehyde. The reaction is uncontrollable because, as mentioned, it's actually easier to reduce an aldehyde than it was to reduce our starting material. So this reaction won't stop here. All right, so now we've got this aldehyde, and typically when you run this reaction, you actually have excess reagents around. So you've got some extra lithium aluminum hydride. I'm gonna draw a second equivalent here. And we can do this all over again. So we've got this H minus. This can attack that carbon, kick up electrons to that oxygen, and we can do a second reduction. All right, and we still have that other organic fragment. That was our leaving group from our first step, so we don't want to neglect that. But at this point, we've done the transfer twice, so hydrides attacked in two separate occasions. All right, at this point, the question is, will this kick down again and kick anything off? No, we don't really have any other good leaving groups to shove off. So at this point, the reaction's kind of exhausted. Nothing more we can do here. So this is the end of step one. <laughs> All right, so at the end of step one, you've got these negative charges on oxygens they are just floating around in solution. What was step two for this reaction? Protonation with water. So I'm just going to show, let me try it this way. We're going to have excess water around. Typically, this is just done in a separatory funnel. So if you have excess water, you can rinse this. And each one of these oxygens will steal a proton from water floating around in your subfunnel. Let 
zoom out a bit. And like I said, you'll get a primary alcohol. It's important to note though that this is step two. Unlike the sodium borohydride example, you actually have to break these up into two separate steps. Does anybody know why? It's kind of hard to see sometimes, but the problem with lithium aluminum hydride is it's a really, really good base as well as a good nucleophile. So what happens if you mix a good base and water? It's going to do acid-base chemistry with water, and your water is going to actually decompose all of your reducing agent, which isn't what we want. So in this reaction, it's important to remember that it's two steps. Sodium borohydride isn't nearly as good of a base as lithium aluminum hydride, so we don't have to worry about the unwanted acid-base chemistry with our alcohol solvents. Does that make sense? All right, so now let's kind of summarize all of this. All right, so first thing we looked at was aldehydes followed by ketones, followed by esters, followed by carboxylic acids. And up here, we said that this has what oxidation state again? Plus one. Over here, we said it was what? Two. And then over here, we said it was plus three and plus three. And the general gist of this is the higher the oxidation state, the harder it is to reduce. So I'm gonna make a line down here saying harder to reduce due to that increased oxidation state. All right, over here, we'll make a list. Reaction with NaBH4. And then over here, I'll say reaction with LAH. That's the abbreviation for lithium aluminum hydride. All right, we said that aldehydes have no problem reacting. They're nice and easy. So what will always happen is we'll be able to reduce it and we'll make a primary alcohol, right? Same thing with ketones. We said with ketones, this is no problem. You can reduce those with sodium borohydride. What about with the ester and aldehyde, or ester and carboxylic acid? Yeah, so we get no reaction. Those were the two where we said we have to use LAH, and then LAH works no problem. So we'll say, all right, with an ester, we can still make a primary alcohol, and this actually transfers two hydrides. In addition, let me keep this as R prime. We fragment it into two pieces. With carboxylic acids, same idea. We can kick this apart. However, we're really not interested in the water that's getting kicked off. We can get water out of our faucets, right? We don't need to do chemistry to make water. All right, question is, what do you think happens in these situations with LAH. Do you think LAH will work with an aldehyde or ketone? It says they're easier to reduce as we go up the column. So it should work if it's an extra strong reducing agent. So yeah, this actually works. So that works. And this works. And every year there's always one kind of smarty pants student that says, well, if that's the case, why don't we just always use lithium aluminum hydride, right? Why did you even bother teaching us sodium borohydride? 
Well, the analogy I like to use is LAH is like firing a cannonball into your system. You lose a lot of your control when you're using an extra strong reducing agent, right? So using sodium borohydride, you regain some of that control. You're not going to accidentally blast apart other functional groups that you didn't mean to uh, leave alone. So I'll show you a situation. So let's say we have this funky molecule. And I treat this with NaBH4, and methanol will be my alcohol. What will my product be out of this? And this will be four points. So see if you can predict what the product would be. All right, let me try to guide you with this really quick. We know that we use these sorts of reagents to reduce carbons that are involved in CO double bonds, right? Will this side react? Yeah, so what I would do is I'd say, yes, that will react. All right, and then we can go over here and we can say, well, what about this side? Will this side react? Okay, why not? It's not strong enough. So then I'd say, will not react and this one will react all right so knowing that we can start to kind of unravel this a bit more we can say all right on the left hand side we're going to get a new hydrogen installed right i'll show that as a green hydrogen but then the purple circled chunk it's just going to hang out and watch the rest of the show happen. It's going to remain untouched. Yep. So if you have two sides that could react, it would be like CAH too. If you had two sides that could react? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. So what would happen if we treated this with LIALH4 followed by water? What would we get out in this situation? Will the aldehyde react in yellow? Yeah. What about the purple side? Yes. Yeah. So in this situation, both would react. Okay. So let's even draw out what that might look like. So the aldehyde side will look entirely the same. The other side, we would have an OH. But we know that these stronger reducing agents actually deliver two hydrogens. What else am I missing? Yeah, the leaving group, right? So over here, we would have HO and then that line, or you could write HOCH3. Either way, we'd be making methanol. So this is where I was saying the smarty pants students that will argue with me and they say, well, I'm just only gonna remember LAH. They forget that knowing sodium borohydride actually gives you the capability of selectively reducing your aldehydes and ketones without touching your carboxylic acids or esters, which is a really powerful tool when you're doing synthesis problems. All right, let's do one more. And then I'll show you my meme. <laughs> Everyone's so excited. All 
All right, before we do this, what reducing agent would we need for this one? LAH, right? Because it's an ester. Followed by water. What do you think we'll get out for this one? I'll give you a few minutes to think about this one. I'll share a trick with you. Whenever I get stuck and I just don't know where to go, I just try to do the mechanism, see if I can rationalize what's going on. So let's do this. First step, we've got lithium aluminum hydride around, right? Aluminum's got the negative charge, lithium's positive charge. We know that really during this step, we're gonna move one of these hydrogens around. So I'd say, well, maybe this hydrogen, like we're used to seeing, will attack that carbonyl. When that happens, we'll kick up electrons right there. Clean this up. So now I've got a hydrogen installed and I've got an oxygen with a negative charge. What happens in the next step? So is water going to protonate that alkoxide or can we do something else first? Well, what I would say is right here, this is almost like a leaving group. Right? Couldn't we kick that off? Okay, so let's do that. If we do that, we can kick that off. Oops. Let me kind of open this up more. And this oxygen is just kind of dangling open now, right? So we've actually cracked the ring open in this process. Are we done now? No. So do we just protonate that alcohol or alkoxide? What else are we forgetting? We can do this again, right? We've got another aldehyde left behind. Let me erase this. Okay, so if we've got another equivalent kind of floating around, you can say, well, this hydride could also attack this aldehyde that we've reformed after this step. Oops, that looks like a positive. Let's fix that. And then we have two hydrogens attached there. And then in this last step, we've got a bunch of water floating around. So what could we do with that water in step two? Protonate all of these. So we could say, all right, let's steal this. And let's steal that. And let's try to make this nice and pretty in the box. So when I go ahead and I look at this, I'd say, all right, I've got one, two, three, four, five carbons, right, in my backbone, which makes sense because over here I said one, two, three, four, five carbons were in my original starting material. So when I draw these out to make them look nice and pretty, I do the zigzag. Where I'd say one, two, three, four, five. Carbon one. What should be coming off of carbon one? An alcohol. All right, and then carbon five? Another alcohol. So we've made a dial. We've actually been able to crack open this entire ring system, which is kind of cool. 
Does that make sense? These can be a little bit tricky, but this might help you with the pod, wink, wink. All right. I had to share this. The Writing and Tutoring Center has been really into their memes lately. So they shared this with me and wanted me to share it with you. Um, but what we'll do for these last few minutes is I would encourage you to get started on your pod. Your pod's actually going to use not only chemistry that we've just learned, but it'll also use chemistry from previous chapters. So see if you can figure out how to do the pod and try to work with a teammate.